Um, Salam alaikum everyone. Uh, my name is Zahra. I'm R2 ICU resident and I'll be talking about abdominal compartment syndrome today. It's a light topic, so I'm not expected more to take more than 30 minutes, inshallah. Um, starting with a brief introduction and then uh, we'll go through definitions, etiologies, physiological consequences, uh, clinical presentation, diagnostic evaluation, and finally management and complications. So um, it's an important cause of multiple organ failure, and it's quite reversible once detected early. However, it is thought to be under-recognized because we're usually dealing with ill patients who are already in multi-organ failure. And so the progress of um, organ failure may not quite be uh, noticeable by the physician. So what's intra-abdominal pressure? Intra-abdominal pressure is basically the pressure within the abdominal cavity. The normal range is five to seven. However, that is, uh, can be higher in patients and people with um, morbid obesity and, uh, and female who are pregnant without any clinical consequences. So abdominal perfusion of pressure is basically the MAB minus intra-abdominal pressure. Um, the local importance of it is that uh, a target of 60 is, um, is correlated with improved survival or with uh, SES. So those patients with uh, abdominal compartment syndrome and are able to maintain an abdominal perfusion of pressure that is 60 and more um, are uh, with improved survival. The systemic importance of it is that it can be used as a resuscitation endpoint. So um, it is actually have been proven to be better than um, lactate clearance, urine output, and even base deficit. So the definition of intra-abdominal hypertension is basically a sustained elevation of blood pressure that is uh, more than 12 millimeter mercury, and it is then further graded into four categories, depending on the severity of elevation from one to four. The highest is 25, and the minimum is 12 to 15. Uh, we have four types, again, of uh, intra-abdominal hypertension, and that based on the underlying clinical scenario. So, if we're dealing with uh, someone who's coughing, uh, sneezing, there is an elevation of intra-abdominal pressure, but that is very brief and it's only uh, lasting for a few seconds without any clinical consequences. And this is called to be uh, hyperacute. However, if then we're dealing with an acute um, elevation, that's usually a surgical abdomen and that happens over, over hours. Uh, so trauma patient, uh, perforation, um, that's an example. Subacute then uh, happens over days, and that's usually a medical uh, condition. So, cirrhotic patients are a typical example. Uh, last one is chronic elevation, and that happens over months or over years, as we said previously pregnancy and morbid obesity. So uh, what is abdominal compartment syndrome? Um, it's basically a sustained elevation of intra-abdominal uh, hypertension that is more than 20 millimeter mercury. It's associated with a new organ failure. Uh, however, that cutoff point um, might be even lower in someone who is having poor abdominal compliance. So this is not a strict three shot of abdominal compartment syndrome. Some patients could develop that syndrome with lower uh, uh, intra-abdominal pressure. The causes of uh, intra-abdominal abdominal compartment syndrome can be either then classified into primary or secondary. Primary is just anything within the abdomen, abdominal pelvic region actually. So um, a trauma to that um, region or even an intervention could lead to ACS. Uh, secondary causes are usually systemic and are uh, usually because of excessive uh, fluid resuscitation or extravasation of a fluid 
Uh, then we will move on to the physiological consequences. Um, basically, the um, presentation in every single organ, how does it affect other organs? Uh, starting with the cardiovascular, uh, there is a direct effect of the raised intra-abdominal pressure. Uh, um, it pushes the diaphragm upward, and so that will lead to cardiac compression, um, reduction in uh, ventricular compliance, and so as the cardiac output. It also embarrasses the venous return by direct compression on the venous uh, return, and that will lead to a reduction in preload and uh, further reduction in cardiac output. The consequences on the pulmonary circulation is um, in multiple um, mechanisms. The first one is um, intra-abdominal pressure could lead to elevation in peak inspiratory pressure, which will lead to uh, alveolar bar trauma and valley, a uh, ventilator-induced um, injury. The second one is uh, the risk of infection is higher in those patients due to inflammatory and cytokine release overall the system. Um, third mechanism is a shunt fraction. There is a direct compression from the um, raised intra-abdominal pressure. It pushes the lung and compresses um, the um, lung. That will lead to atelectasis, further edema, and intrapulmonary shunt. Uh, its effect on the renal system is thought to be through a major mechanism, which is renal vein compression. Um, there are other theories, but this is the major one. So um, a reduction in a venous, a a venous drainage will lead to a drop in GFR and renal impairment. The second theory is thought to be because of a reduction of cardiac output. Uh, that will lead to overactivation of the rest system and a vasoconstriction and final outcome is a drop in GFR. Uh, its effect on the GI tract is thought to be actually the most sensitive um, organ to uh, ACS. Logically, we're talking about uh, an organ that is contained within that compartment. So, uh, a sustained elevation of a pressure within that compartment will directly affect the organ within it. So again, a direct compression on the mesenteric veins will uh, impair the venous flow, and that will lead to uh, intestinal edema and further elevation in intra-abdominal pressure. The second mechanism is, uh, as that progress, actually, it's not a second mechanism, as that progress, it will lead to further hyperperfusion, bowel ischemia, and um, sepsis, which will further exacerbate the overall condition. Its effect on the hepatic uh, is quite interesting because even if the cardiac output is maintained, and even if the MAP is maintained, and you have done your uh, best with the resuscitation, and the patient is adequately resuscitated, there is um, impairment in lactate clearance in those patients. Um, it can actually start as simple as um, a 10 millimeter mercury within the abdominal compartment syndrome could impair lactate clearance. The last one is uh, CNS. So as the intra-abdominal pressure uh, increases, the drainage of a venous system throughout our, throughout our body will be impaired. Um, so a CNS is not an exception. We will end up having raised intracranial pressure, which will further lead to uh, impairment in the perfusion and could progress and severe cases to cerebral ischemia. This is just a summary of what I have just mentioned. So clinical presentation, usually we're dealing with patient with uh, a patient who are unable to communicate and uh, the symptoms 
may not be reliable, but if they were ever to complain, it will be an abdominal pain, which is a local effect, or it could be just a systemic complaint, which is a dizziness and syncope. A signs, uh, well, the classical sign is a tense abdomen. However, uh, this uh, accuracy is just 80% and its sensitivity is as low as 50. So uh, it should not be relied on. Imaging uh, are not used to diagnose abdominal compartment syndrome. We are, uh, we are not relying on imaging to diagnose it. It is just be, uh, be done for, uh, to rule out any other differential diagnosis. There are no specific findings for ACS, uh, either on X-ray or even on CT scan. Um, so the diagnosis should be based on your clinical sense and whenever you suspect ACS, abdominal compartment syndrome, uh, you should uh, go and measure the intra-abdominal pressure. Um, this can be done through different methods. Um, it can be done through intragastric or intracolonic or intravesicular, uh, which is um, a catheter in the bladder. And the last one is IVC catheter. So the most common way of measuring intra-abdominal pressure, uh, and actually the simplest, uh, is uh, intra-bladder catheter. Uh, the materials are quite available in every, in every uh, ICU, uh, so it's quite affordable, and it is the least invasive. It actually could reflect the exact intra-abdominal pressure uh, as com if we compare it to other methods. Uh, the technique, uh, I'll actually go with, uh, I'll actually go with you over this link. It's a, a short clip. In order to measure intra-abdominal pressure via the bladder technique, your patient needs a conventional single lumen indwelling urinary catheter. You will also need the following items. Pressure transducer setup, including TransPAC IV monitoring kit and 500 milliliter IV bag of normal saline, a pressure bag and transducer cable, transducer holder, IV pole, and finally a 30 milliliter lure lock tip syringe. After complete setup and priming the pressure transducer system, change the name or label of the line to CVP on the monitor. Then, attach the 30 milliliter lure lock tip syringe to the distal stopcock of the transducer tubing. Your patient should lie supine if tolerated, and the bladder should be completely drained. Level and zero the air fluid interface to the iliac crest at the mid-axillary line. Next, clamp the urinary catheter just distal to the sampling port. Clean the sampling port with an alcohol swab, and then connect the transducer tubing to the sampling port. Turn the transducer tubing's distal stopcock off to the patient and while activating the squeeze flush, pull back the syringe plunger and fill to a maximum of 25 milliliters. Turn the stopcock off to the normal saline and inject the 25 milliliters of normal saline into the bladder. Do not inject more than 25 milliliters into the bladder. Expel any air between the clamp and the urinary catheter by opening the clamp briefly and allowing the normal saline to flow back past the clamp and then reclamp. Allow 30 to 60 seconds after installation to allow for detrusor muscle relaxation. At end expiration, mark the pressure reading on the monitor. After you've taken measurements, unclamp the urinary catheter tubing to allow drainage to continue. You may leave the transducer setup connected to the catheter if serial measurements are ordered and remember to subtract 25 milliliters from the patient's urine output. The World Society of the Abdominal Compartment Syndrome defines intra-abdominal hypertension as a sustained or repeated pathological elevation in intra-abdominal pressure greater than or equal So that's the technique of measuring intra-abdominal pressure. So how accurate that is? Actually, it's the most accurate as compared to other methods, as I said previously. 
However, its accuracy can be reduced significantly in those patients who are uh, having adhesions or having a neurogenic bladder, for instance. So um, what we need for accurate measurement is a free movement of the bladder wall. And anything could uh, impair that, it will lead to a reduction in its accuracy. So once diagnosed, uh, your management should be based mainly on supportive measures. And if that fails, we could then move to abdominal decompression which is considered the definitive management. So um, supportive measures uh, are generally speaking tackling the uh, primary condition, which is ACS, or even the uh, complication of ACS. So for instance, a proper positioning could help a reduction of uh, venous drainage. Um, so it could reduce the chance of um, ICV elevation. That's one of the complications. It could also reduce the chance of VAP. Um, measuring uh, other measures uh, could improve the uh, abdominal compliance, like uh, proper analgesia and paralytic agent once needed. It could also um, improve the chest wall compliance, which is a complication of ACS. A third uh, measures are mechanical ventilation. Again, um, we're dealing with the pulmonary complication, so reduction with, uh, of the volume of the tidal volume could reduce the chance of pyrotrauma and a valley. The last one is um, hemodynamic support. So when you're resuscitating a patient with um, with risk factors of ACS, you should be uh, keeping your patient uh, on a negative balance or at least on uh, not on the negative balance, not on the positive balance, sorry. The last supportive measure that can be uh, helpful is a drainage procedure, and that can be done through the nasogastric or rectal tube. Uh, also, paracentesis um, are considered another drainage method. And uh, last one is a uh, catheter uh, drainage. Um, so percutaneous catheter drainage is uh, considered only successful if you are able to drain one liter and you're able to drop the intra-abdominal pressure of nine millimeter mercury in the first four hours. If you fail to do so, then uh, your likelihood of uh, progressing into uh, surgical decompression is high. So as I said, if you fail to uh, manage the patient with a general measures, supportive measures, your final step is abdominal decompression. Um, again, there is no uh, specific figure for that. We're not dealing or treating figures. You're uh, talking about a patient. When you see that your patient is deteriorating and you have already failed the initial measures, you should just proceed for it. So there are uh, multiple approaches. I don't want to confuse you, but uh, generally speaking, um, one of the recommendations is just to move on for surgical decompression. If the intra-abdominal pressure is more than 25, uh, other would recommend a lower three should, like 15 to 25. Um, it has been linked to better prognosis and better um, uh, reversibility of organ failure. So the earlier, the better. Uh, finally, the complications, uh, as I said, it's multi-organ failure, so um, it could lead to cerebral ischemia, uh, renal failure, hepatic failure, and um, pulmonary failure as well. Bottom line, uh, it's a potentially reversible condition, so detect it early and think of it if you're dealing with a shocked patient and having those risk factors. Um, diagnosis and even management uh, should, ne uh, should never be based on a specific figure. Uh, use your clinical sense, uh, you're not treating a figure. That's it. Thank you. Actually, thank you very much. This is a, a very concise lecture and it is very clear. Um, just if uh, you allow me, Dr. Zahra. So we heard today about something called abdominal diffusion pressure. Uh, we can think about 
another item with the same name which is brain perfusion pressure so both have the same principle it is the mean blood pressure minus the pressure inside the closed compartment so the brain perfusion pressure is the mean arterial blood pressure minus the intracranial pressure abdominal com- and perfusion pressure is the mean arterial blood pressure minus the abdom- intra-abdominal pressure so we usually um, have a normal mean blood pressure around 70 or 65 so if we need the abdominal perfusion pressure more than 60 so we have to minus only from 5 to 10 of that so this is why the normal intra-abdominal pressure is between 5 to 10. we have two clinical entity one is called abdominal hypertension which is happen if the pressure inside the abdomen is more than 12 but abdominal compartmental syndrome by itself it means that the pressure more than 20 and associated with end organ damage um, in the in the brain perfusion pressure sometimes if there is a trauma and intracerebral hemorrhage you may say that we need to elevate the mean blood pressure to support the brain perfusion actually it will not help that much in the abdominal compartmental syndrome why of that because as dr zahra mentioned most of the problem is from venous compression from high pressure so even if you elevate the mean arterial pressure the veins will be occluded by the high pressure in the abdomen especially the renal vein this is why it will make a bad pressure in the kidney and this is why it will end in acute uh, renal failure also if the vein is collapsing in the abdomen less venous return will come back to the heart and also if the abdomen pressure is high it make compression on the ventricle allow it to uh, become less ability to or less able to uh, get more blood flow inside it in that stool both of them will end by uh, low cardiac output regarding the lung just be sure that intra-abdominal hypertension will lead to increase in deep and the plateau pressure both not on the mm. deep because it affects the compliance of the lung so whatever affects the compliance of the lung peak and the plateau both elevated so this is why it is either go to paralyze the patient or you can go for make him little negative pressure by uh, getting the fluid out or by drain ascites or just simply by decompression surgically and decompression surgery they open the abdomen yeah? they open the muscle open the um, uh, the abdomen and key and leave it open until whatever the cause of abdominal compartmental syndrome is uh, uh, reversed the, oh, the another important issue uh, is the, how can you measure it make sure that we have to inject like 25 milliliter of normal saline in an empty bladder before we uh, measure the intra why is that because the bladder is a pelvic organ so if we inject 25 milliliter of normal saline the bladder will approach to the abdomen so it can the pressure inside the bladder is reflecting the abdominal pressure and they mention uh, don't go beyond 25 and some books said 50 why of that because if we inject a lot of saline before we're measuring the, the, the bladder pressure you may stretch the muscle in the wall of the bladder and if you stretch the muscle in the wall of the bladder, it will reflexly contract. So if the wall of the bladder muscle contract, it creates a higher pressure than expected to be there from the abdomen. Yani the, it will reflect the abdominal pressure plus the pressure from the muscle contraction from the wall of the bladder. This is why it's very important not to inject a lot of fluid before the measurement. The second important issue, you have to measure it in a zero level, which is at a midpoint from the sensus pupus. This is very important to put your zero level at the uh, level. The third important, which measure you will take? Definitely during inspiration, what will happen in the abdomen? The fat will go down and the abdominal pressure will increase definitely. So we'll take the measurement at the end of expiration. It's very important. Uh, this is the patient who is spontaneous to breathing. What about the patient in mechanical ventilation? Also at the end of expiration, we can take the measure because during inspiration, I push a lot of air in the lung, increase the interpathic pressure, which is reflected by increasing the blood pressure also. So in spite of that, it is very uh, short topic. It is very important. And the most cause of abdominal compartmental syndrome in our ICU is the high fluid recitation, especially in sepsis patients. Why is that? Because they have a capillary leak. Uh, 
and the, the area that can be leaked and you cannot notice it is the abdomen. This is why the edema in the abdominal wall and the fluid that leaks inside the abdomen, creating a high pressure in the abdomen. And then you will see that your lactate clearance is decreasing and you will see also your renal function is deteriorating. If you suspect that there is abdominal compartmental syndrome, just go to measure the intra-abdominal pressure and deal uh, by whatever uh, the method to decrease it. Uh, it is a very good lecture and very uh, concise, and we allow uh, the question now, if anybody had a question, to Dr. Zahra.